It's a nice thought. Well, I have an interesting way to do a show, so I sort of wrote this game plan for a show, and so far it's uh, it's been working out. But it's you know it's just as much fun as you would think it is to sort of sit there and you know a little over a year ago I was sitting on a couch talking to a buddy about this idea, and now a year later this show's airing, and there's fine actors like Tom playing roles, and you know it's pretty fun. And the ratings have been good, which is very yeah. important. So I also know that from the network <laughs> side. I have no illusions, no illusions whatsoever. My friends are like, oh, what do you think of the ratings now? I'm like, well, it's a little harder to wait for them than it was. So I never realized. So I, I wanted the show to air Friday night at wrestling after wrestling, because wrestling is a really big lead in. And this is kind of like a cheap, fun, cheerful show. Uh, I didn't think it through that you don't get Friday night ratings until Monday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> so you have the entire weekend to sweat the ratings. So that's, that's the only downside to the whole thing. Do you think that your network experience had anything to do with that? Or <laughs> like your behind the scenes experience? Or do you think that it was just, you know, you just have a good vision? Uh, well, you know, I, I one of the reasons I sort of was thinking about the idea of the show is that um, when sci-fi does what's called acquired shows where they pay like a lower license fee and they don't do as much development work, um, primarily those shows are coming out of, say, Canada, like a Lost Girl or a Bitten, where the show's already produced and then brought to sci-fi. Um, but when those shows are made for another network in another country first, they don't really take into account the needs of sci-fi, right? You know, sci-fi just becomes the sort of secondary market for them. And, uh, you know, one of the things is like, it, wouldn't it be great if, if we went to a production company and they knew kind of what would work on the network or what we thought we, we hoped would work? And so um, when, I, when I sort of conceived the idea of the show, in the back of my mind was, oh, it would probably air here and it would probably get, you know, but in the channel there's, there's on-air promotion, which is just commercials on the network, and then there's what they call off-air promotion, which is like billboards and things like that. And generally, an acquired show doesn't really get off-air promotion, so it has to be what we call like a self-starting show. So, you know, you had to have a show that was like, if you knew what it was about, you would either know right away if you wanted to try it or not. And so, you know, like, it kind of like met all those criteria and was a really compelling story that I don't think has really been seen on TV before was not just a zombie show, but a zombie show where they're literally going across the entire U.S. in the hope of a cure. So. You just mentioned uh, going across the entire U.S. Yeah. and I was very excited that we got to see different places. Um, oh yeah. Sometimes these shows, they just sort of settle in a city and then they decide later to get to that. Yeah. Um, are you thinking about expanding out, like out of the United States? Would that be something that we would see? Yes, no, maybe, kind of. I mean, the, the initial idea is for them to get to California, so it's all within the country. Um, you know, you could take it in other directions. I think in the first season, you know, we kind of know that we're staying within the U.S. I mean, the thing is we're making it for a U.S. network, so you primarily want to stay in. I think there are stories and perhaps in other forms, maybe comics or something like that, where you could certainly tell this story from around the world. I don't think we quite have the budget yet to go outside of the U.S., <laughs> uh, but, you know, certainly there is, there is something. In the, this is not in the, in the uh, current incarnation of the show, but in the, uh, one of the original incarnations, there was actually a Russian contingent that, that, that I had in the back of my mind that you sort of ran into, but, uh, you know, it's, that's not within our scope, and then we kind of, we, that, that, that guy got left by the wayside, but that would be really cool. I mean, it is a worldwide apocalypse, so you could tell stories pretty much anywhere. What made so. you want to get on the zombie bandwagon, and then what made you do this particular take? Well, for me, it's not a bandwagon, because I, I was actually trying to get sci-fi to make a zombie show, like, ten years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'm a zombie fan. Not I'm, I'm a genre fan, and, you know, I also like Downton Abbey and Mad Men and stuff like that, but, you know, I'm a big genre fan, and I always thought that this is a really great... Um, venue. The zombie apocalypse is a great venue to tell stories in because, you know, there's a lot of things that zombies represent, right? They represent, like, everything we fear, but everything we fear to become, you know, it, it has a little bit of, like, that sort of, um, you know, like, brother versus brother, like, you might have to kill your family member, you know, so there's so many great stories, and I think that a lot of the zombie stuff we've seen, the movies, um, and obviously Walking Dead and stuff, but a lot of that is really focused on that one moment in time where the zombie apocalypse happened and now everyone's surviving. And I've always wanted to tell the sort of, okay, well, what about the people three years from now who are somewhat competent at fighting zombies? They're no longer just absolutely terrified that they're going to get killed. You know, they can kind of take them. I mean, it's still horribly dangerous and you could die at any moment. And I really wanted to tell that competent uh, zombie survival story. 
Um, I did a movie with the asylum called Zombie Apocalypse, and we told a little bit of that story where they had some really competent zombie guys, and basically they were just trying to get to safety. They were trying to cure the world. They were just trying to get to an island sanctuary. So, um, but yeah, that story. I mean, I've had that story in my mind for like ten years. So, I, I think the Walking Dead paved the way for other shows to be on. But it wasn't like, oh, The Walking Dead, like, let's copy them. This is an idea that was, you know, predates The, the Walking Dead, at least in my brain. So. Well, the zombie kills on your show have been amazing. <laughs> oh, thank and, you. And uh, my favorite so far, my wife and I even replayed it, was The Liberty Bell. Oh, yeah, yes. The Liberty Bell. We had a lot of discussion about The Liberty Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to see more fun landmarks rolling Oh, yeah. Well, you know, like one, of, one of the I things... I really want to see we, that. <laughs> there's actually, in the writer's room, there's a map on the wall oh. and, of where nice. they go. And then we look up things along their route to see, like, what we can put in there. So there was very much a drive to put, like, like Americana in the show because they're traveling across mm -hmm. the, the U.S. And, you know... Um, I wrote the first episode I wrote is episode six and they're actually in like wheat fields in Missouri, you know, and stuff like that. So, you know, and there's, you know, like, oh, getting across the Mississippi River, or getting to the Grand Canyon, those things become problematic in the zombie apocalypse. So yeah, we really want to like show you sort of the breadth of the of the US and then show you, you know, like things that are you could only get in those areas, you know, which I Amish zombie, I mean you have to <laughs> at least throw that in there. And then there's a cute little backstory about how the Amish wanted to you know, isolate themselves, and that didn't work out so well for them. So, yeah, we've got more stuff coming. Yeah. Well, can you tell us about more stuff coming? Very little, because it's so spoilery. <laughs> it's such a spoilery show. Tom and I are done. We were just down in line at Starbucks, and we're like, yeah, we really can't say anything, can we? So, um, you know, it's the zombie apocalypse. Not everybody is safe. Um, people may not make it to California or they may not make it to California at all for various reasons so you know there's there's a lot going on we have any, a lot of interesting stuff any guest stars coming up that you can talk about at all I don't not that I remember off the top of my head I mean there's definitely some like little fun things here and there but nothing I can uh, I can come up with off the top of my head okay when you were question. when you were developing the show and you had the characters one way. Did that change when the actors kind of inhabit? Oh yeah, those yeah, that changes. So TV changes a lot as, the, yeah. as as time goes on, and you know, like sometimes we just before we even cast them, we wholesale changed characters for for various reasons. Um, and then as the actors inhabit the roles, then you, as a writer, you you try to write to their strengths, and then they suggest their their abilities suggest new avenues that you haven't thought of. So the characters really don't come to life until you actually cast them and then when you see them and then it actually takes a couple episodes for everybody to sort of get comfortable in their characters you know so i mean the one thing i knew going in is um i like strong female characters because i have a lot of strong females in my life and if there was a zombie apocalypse like my mother would survive my wife would survive you know what i mean and so you know we have we have several strong female roles which i'm very happy about but also we're not in your face about it we're not like oh strong female roles you know we're just like oh no they're very competent women like Kalita who uh, plays Warren is like amazing and then um, Addie and Cassandra you know they all are strong female characters in their own way and that's one thing I was really excited about and believe it or not I'm excited that people haven't really noticed because I feel like oh we've 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 given you your medicine but it didn't taste like medicine it tastes like sugar you know so it's like we've we've altered this sort of pattern of of this a little bit and i think uh that makes me really happy so you've dealt with comparisons in the past i was a big fan of your work at sci-fi oh, i loved um you bringing being human oh yeah yeah US. um and that sort of became its own thing yeah that became its own show yeah, yeah. um how would you respond to people who are comparing you so heavily to The Walking Dead? What would you try to tell them to entice them to move away from that sort of comparison? Well, first of all, I think it's very natural. And I, I don't, it doesn't upset me. Like, I knew going in, as soon as I put, like, in the pitch of the show is a little paragraph that says, and yes, we are going to be compared to The Walking Dead, <laughs> and this is what we'll say. I think what's really interesting is that there's like a million cop shows, so when a new cop show comes out, you don't compare it to the other ones because there's too many. There's a million hospital shows, um, but there's only one real, really big zombie show in almost the history of TV. I mean, there have been a few other things, but they're not really, you know, the scope of The Walking Dead. So, of course, you're going to get compared. I don't blame anyone. If, if I had never heard of it, I'd be like, oh, how does this compare to The Walking Dead? I kind of, in my mind, had this idea of, okay, how many episodes will it take until people realize, oh, it's really not The Walking Dead. It's something of its own. And it took three until I really started to see people be like, no, no, no. And now you see people defending, not, not necessarily defending because I don't think it needs defending, but you know, like answering that question of why, you know, is this not like The Walking Dead? Um, 
you know, there are worse things to be compared to the number one show in the history of basic cable, and The Walking Dead is a great show. Um, and I think, you know, the only thing I don't want is people to show up thinking, oh, this is just The Walking Dead, and then all of a sudden there's like zombie babies and tornadoes and the Liberty Bell, and them being like, what the hell is going on? Um, but, you know, we try to prepare everyone for that, you know, and let them know. But the comparison doesn't bother me. I think it's totally natural. Um, and, you know, the, we're just different. And I always say, like, listen, like, I'm a Walking Dead fan. I've seen every episode. Like, watch them both. Like, I would if I were just, you know, it's not like there's 30 zombie shows that you have to choose from. Like, there's two, and they don't even run that long. You know, we're a 13 episode first season. The Walking Dead generally only airs six before they go on hiatus. So it's not like there's a glutch where you have to choose. So I'm like, watch them both. Well, the biggest difference is the humor. Yeah, yeah. I humor mean, is a big one. I mean, we wanted to go in because. You know, I compared it a lot to, uh, this is going to sound weird, but like Band of Brothers, where they're in this horrible situation, but it's a group of people who've become closer, and they joke around. I mean, it's gallows humor. It's your natural, it's natural human reaction to, to awfulness is often to joke. That's what the term of gallows humor is. And it's always kind of struck me, like, I would be cracking jokes in the zombie apocalypse, you know, even as, the worse it got, the funnier I would sort of make it to, to make it seem less horrible. So, you know, and I very much think like, you know, there would be people, there would be fun moments too. Like you're gonna have, somewhere in there, you're gonna have a good day. And there's gonna be one day where the sun is shining, you've got water, you've got food, and there's no zombies. And you're gonna be like, ah, oh, this is what life was like. And then the next day it's gonna be like, ah, oh, we're back to killing zombies with hammers, you know? But you know, so there's gotta be some good moments in there, so. If you were in a zombie apocalypse, what would be your weapon of choice? I've thought a lot about this, and I'm going to go into some detail on this for you. Okay. So if you actually think about it, it's really hard to kill a human brain. There's like, if you like, you read stories about people who've been in the emergency room, like a guy will show up and he'll be like, I have a headache. And they'll be like, you've been shot in the head. You have a bullet in your head. And he's like, oh, I didn't notice. Like, that is not uncommon, right? So like, it's not easy at all to kill a person. Um, if you want to use a gun, you're going to have to worry about the sound drawing a lot of zombies to you. But you can't really use a baseball bat because that's a blunt object, and you actually need a corner to get through a, through a bone. I'm telling you, I've thought a lot about this. <laughs> um, so you want something quiet. You want something like it, like that's a bat, but you want something that has edges on it. A flanged mace is what I would go for. I would go right for the nearest museum and I would get a flanged mace. And there's actually one online. If you Google flanged mace zombies, there's a company that makes a flanged mace for, for killing zombies. And that's, I, I'm thinking about ordering one for Christmas. I'm not even kidding. Like I have a zombie show. I should have a flanged mace. That is what I, that's God what I would have. A zombie apocalypse yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would want that. Here. I would really want that. Because it's also, you know, like, You'd be swinging, like, it'd take you, like, ten swings to honestly put down somebody, you know? Like, oh, you're going to get tired. Like, that's hard work. <laughs> and they'll you probably need, get you. Yeah, yeah right? So, right. so I'm going with flange mace. <laughs> oh, I probably have a bunch of guns, too, just in case. Funniest kill for you so far? Ooh, Watching it kill. as a viewer yourself. Funniest kill. You got to go with the Liberty Bell. Yeah. yeah. You got to go with the Liberty Bell. I mean, and that was, you know, that was, that was actually a lot of production. Like, that bell looks really good. Um, <laughs> on set, it's just a giant piece of green foam. So, it actually, seeing it, like, live on TV for the first time when it was completely done is actually, like, it looks really good. Like, you think, oh, that's a Liberty Bell and someone spray painted it. So, that's pretty cool. But in uh, episode... Six. There's my favorite, which of course is the one I wrote. Huh? Uh, is uh, um, my favorite death, but I can't say anything about it. But you'll see it. Can you talk to us at all about what's going on with Murphy? Sure. Um, when are we going to find out more? You you learn on? a little bit more about Murphy every episode. Um, I think up until now we've seen him. Well, uh, this next episode, which airs tomorrow night, uh -huh. um, you're going to see him uh, deal with some issues mm -hmm. and undergo a little bit of a change. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like this bit. open question of what's going on with Murphy. You know, he's, he's looking a little worse, worse for wear, some body parts, teeth aren't really functioning the right way. So Murphy is integral. You know, Murphy, the entire show revolves around him. And, and the actor, Keith Allen, is amazing. He has just walked in and killed this role and been 
been stupendous in it. And it's a it's a difficult role. I mean, I've got a lot of pictures of me on, on set with him looking worse and worse. You know, we're doing selfies and he's just like, Ugh. and I'm like, oh God, I don't even think I could show that to my <laughs> wife, Keith. That's, you're looking bad. And the worse we make him, the more he enjoys it. So. And speaking of uh, character development, um, some writers, they kind of just go with the flow and they have like a rough kind of idea of where they're going to or are you more of a writer that has everything kind of like built in and you're just kind of waiting for the dominoes to fall against you? It's a little bit of both. We kind of know where we're going with a lot of them but you kind of leave yourself a lot of room to discover things along the way. Um, Like a great example is Keith uh, who plays Murphy. One day he came up to me and we were filming and he said you know wouldn't this happen with my character and I thought I said yeah you know what it would and then I he's had this idea and then I said yeah let me try that and then I went to the showrunner Carl Schaefer who's a co-creator of the show and he, he's, he runs it day to day and I said you know Carl Keith had this idea I want to do it and do this and Carl's like yeah give that a try and then I wrote a couple pages that night Carl looked them over and he always takes a final pass at everything and did his edit and then we literally shot it the next morning and it was just because Keith who's more aware of his character now than we are because he's the guy that lives him every day actually you know noticed this thing would be happening and you know he brought it to our attention we're like yeah absolutely so so it's both we kind of know where everyone's going but then you discover a lot of stuff along the way Craig you've uh, you've been at sci-fi and you really have seen the whole digital transition yeah 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 I mean that must have been something to go through from well I was the head of digital at yeah, sci-fi I know. so you I kind of kind of responsible for yeah that. and you know I really uh, it's kind of interesting the conclusion I came to is that you know it's like that old saying like content is king like really at the end of the day what people want to watch is t- good TV shows and so the best thing that you can do if you want to be in the TV business is make a show that people want to watch and I've always been a sort of creator and so I've decided you know all my digital wisdom is like yeah make a really good show <laughs> and then people will watch it on whatever medium that they can but you know I think that's really a kind of what what I learned from all that is like people want stuff when they want it and where they want it and the best way to, to service that is make something great that they can't get enough of you know because it is tough you know it's it's hard in the TV business when people are watching illegally and it's taking away the ad revenue that you need to make the show I, I have a trainer and we were at the gym and he'd been away and he hadn't seen the show and I said oh you should go watch it and he's like, yeah, I'll just go download it from the internet. I'm like, Chad, <laughs> Chad, just, just take money out of my pocket. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was like, you know what? If, if you like it, then go, like, tell a friend about it. Because the number one thing you can do to help a TV show is tell other people about it. So I was I was okay with it. Although it was dismaying, but it was fun. So. Okay, that's, uh, that's okay. it for this. We're done? Thanks oh, for well, thanks for all the great uh, questions, guys. It was a you. pleasure to chat with you. Yeah, same here. So how many of you guys are going to be going to the panel? Nobody. You're no. Yes. No, none of the rest of you? No. Okay. Oh, just one of you. 